I know it's getting a little bit, it's getting towards the end of the day. You've been an amazing audience and it, it, there's been so much content, it's amazing. I want to first of all liven you up by uh, welcoming Lynn, who has something extraordinarily exciting to announce. So bring on Lynn. <laughs> I identify as an incredibly stressed out parent. Anybody with me? <laughs> so we have in this room today many individuals who have been irreversibly, irrevocably damaged by the sloppiest, most irresponsible medical care ever known in, on this planet, in my opinion. In addition, we have more parents than probably most of us even realize. Proportion of parents here tonight, today in this room I, I do know is very high. And uh, there is no lawsuit in the world that will ever reclaim what has been lost. It can't happen, but it needs to happen anyway. So here in this room, we have survivors. And many of us were in Killarney back in April when our friends down the street mentioned that they knew that we had the right to talk, but they also have the right not to listen. Well, just imagine that, refusing to listen to people who took your medicine just as you prescribed it, and now they are suffering, and you don't even need to listen. And last year at the American Academy of Pediatrics Convention in Anaheim, many of us were there, along with Aaron Friday. <laughs> Yay, one of my heroes. <laughs> and we were just calmly handing out information to pediatricians on the scientific data around the safety and efficacy of gender-affirming care. And the doctors were told at the opening plenary session not to talk to us by the president of the American Academy of Pediatrics. One pediatrician took the packet of information from me, looked me in the eyes and said, I want this information, but people will be mad at me for taking it. He's a pediatrician, he can't take a bag full of studies. Imagine a doctor being afraid to take that. The pressure is certainly intense, and the refusal to hear what we are discussing today is incredible. Well, they probably should start listening, because at the current time, there are nine lawsuits that I'm aware of in the US, and that number is surely about to explode. Here in America, nothing motivates us like a good lawsuit. Am I right? But litigation in this area is extremely difficult for a variety of reasons, which I don't have time to elaborate right now, and I can't even do that because I'm not an attorney. Um, many states have statute of limitation rules that are so short that it's absolutely impossible that anyone will ever get to the place where they're ready to sue before their time is up. There's also caps on damages, things like that. It's difficult, um, and no case has been won yet, and so there's no precedent. It can cost seventy dollars to $100,000 even to file a case. People just flippantly tell detransitioners, oh, you should sue. Well, they can't get a lawyer, and the lawyers don't have the money, and even if they're able to work pro bono, even if they're willing to volunteer their time, and if they still have to earn a living, they can maybe take one of these cases or two of these cases, maybe. And then what are they going to fund the bill themselves? And they don't know if they'll ever get a, a judgment. So it, this is very problematic. So yeah, that's where the Themis Resource Fund is coming in. And I think we're placed at a beautiful time for this. And we will be assisting DTrans plaintiffs to find an attorney, and we will be helping to fund these cases. <laughs> At this time, we are already funded, and we are ready to help. We know that there are attorneys that want to represent these cases, and we've met with them, and we are um, partnering with them, we welcome more. We want to talk to you if you're an attorney. We want to put you on our website, which just launched this weekend, themisresourcefund.org. Um, and we will be, I'll be available. I have a table back there. Uh, several of us will be there to talk with you um, if you'd like to learn more about our process. If you are a DTrans potential plaintiff, an attorney that will, uh, or an attorney who would like to be added to our directory, or most importantly, if you have a few dollars you can send our way, 
We'd really appreciate it. We are funded, but there's, we're not funded enough. We're, we, need, we need help. We need financial donations. We, we, it comes to money, and we do need more. Um, so consider supporting us if you're able to. Any small amount will help. And uh, we're working on a volunteer basis. We've kept our overhead very low, so these funds are going to go directly to the cases. Uh, we have applied for 501c3 um, charity status with the IRS, so your donations will be um, tax deductible um, retroactively once we have um, met all the IRS requirements, which we're working on doing. Um, so we are, uh, we're, we're doing this so that we can, uh, we're gonna pursue justice. We're gonna bring healthcare providers, therapists, and organizations like the AAP to accountability. Also, if you're good at Twitter and you wanna be on my team, <laughs> please. <laughs> I know, I know. It's hopeless, it's a Hail Mary. <laughs> okay, um, and so yeah, so if you like the Bird app, uh, and you want an anonymous behind the scenes job where no one will know who you are, it's a great opportunity. I'm trying to sell it here. Uh, <laughs> so anyway, in short, the time for legal accountability is here. Like, follow, support us, and I'm so grateful for the help of uh, the GenSpec team and uh, especially for Stella. Uh, so it's, it's themis, themis.org, is it? Themis.org. Themisresourcefund.org. Themis is T H E M I S. And Lynn is outside with a table, lots of information there. Really, really exciting. We've been talking about the detransition lawsuits forever. Now there's an actual, very practical way to channel this. I'm going to bring on Kathleen for a second. This is all part of my talk. <laughs> bring people on. Kathleen's got something else that's very worthy. Thank you, thank you. Thank you. And um, <clears throat> if Themis Resource Fund, Seems like too much of a mouthful to say, just say turf. <laughs> so I'm Kathleen Dooley. I am the mother of an absolutely beautiful 17-year-old, 19-year-old daughter who fell down, was lured down the rabbit hole over four years ago. I'm also the East Coast leader of our duty, a parent support, international parent support group. We have a table here, many of you stop by, thank you very much. We support parents that are living through the trauma and tragedy inflicted on families by this dangerous gender ideology. I'm also a recovering lawyer. I, <laughs> with over 30 years of civil litigation experience, which I have leveraged to do what I can as I fly under the radar so that my daughter will not detect what I'm doing, to seek justice for detransitioners in the courts and legislators, and to shine a light on the reality to the general public. And I, like many parents, are grateful to GenSpect for supporting our legal efforts. For example, last year, GenSpect supported us. Um, I don't know if you're familiar with Jane Wheeler. She's the president of Rethink Identity Medicine Ethics. But she and I undertook the task of dra drafting a complaint that we submitted to the FTC alleging that a Miami butcher by the name of Sive Gallagher has violated Section 5A of the FTC Act with false and deceptive use of Instagram and TikTok directed at minors. Specifically by promoting mastectomies as safe, effective, and medically necessary. Recently, non-parents have approached our duty in GenSpec because they want to help. I'm talking therapists, doctors, lawyers. A little over a year ago, we were approached by Nancy Stade. She's a FD, former FDA lawyer with almost 20 years of experience working at the FDA. She, like me, is the mother of an adopted Asian child. Her daughter's in a class with 12 girls, 11 of whom identify as male. Her daughter does not, fortunately. But Nancy smelled something absolutely rotten and said, we have to do something. She said, I can help draft a citizen petition to the FDA calling for the systematic review of the off-label prescription of puberty blockers. It took Jane Wheeler 
and Nancy Stade and I about a year to put this together. Genspect was a signatory to this petition. We filed it in the beginning of September. It received over 300 comments because it is now open for public comment and it will be for quite some time. The other signatories I'd like to call out are Rethink Identity Medicine Ethics, Our Duty USA, and this is to let you know how serious this really is. International Partners for Ethical Care, Dr. J. Allen. Dr. J. Allen is a retired physician in Maine who approached our duty. He's battling cancer right now, but he wants to fight this. And so he put his name on the, on the petition as well. We also have Dr. Miriam Grossman, who you all have seen her, some of her books around here today. Dr. Patrick Hunter, Dr. William Malone, Dr. Quentin Van Meter, D. Trans Help, Fair in Medicine, Gender Dysphoria Alliance, and Gender Exploratory Therapy Alliance. Nancy submitted it, as I said, in September. We received over 300 comments, but we still need more comments. Nancy said that that was unprecedented to get that many comments in a two-week period following the filing. So my, you know, even though the pharmaceutical industry has all but emasculated the FDA when it comes to off-label uh, prescriptions, they do have some authority left, and we've called upon them to, to rise up and use that authority to call for the systematic review. So we need to lean on the FDA to step up and to use that authority to do this. So I am leaving flyers that look like this on the Themis and Our Duty table. If you download the QR code, you will see the FDA petition. You will also see documents on how to comment and, and FAQs. We would appreciate it um, if you would join us in this battle to get this done, because this is the first step. If we can get the FDA to pay attention to the puberty blockers, then we can move on to the off-label prescription of testosterone and estrogen. Thank you. Okay. Hello. So we're coming towards, again, coming towards the end of the day. We're going to have a lovely panel discussion, a lovely one in a couple of minutes where uh, the, all the psychotherapists are going to come together and we're going to talk about the psychological roots of gender. And we, we uh, you know, welcome questions just to kind of keep things lively because it, it's been a long day. So think up any questions you can ask our panel. It'll be written on the program, all the, all the psychotherapists that we have um, on, the, on the panel. I'm just giving you a quick run through of where we've been uh, in Genspect and where we're going. So we started off as a voice for parents in 2021 in June, it was about a year after kind of COVID had struck and I'd done all these parents meetings and I realized that when the, when the history of, of gender is written, there's gonna be a chapter on the parents. And that chapter is arguably going to be one of the most harrowing chapters where parents have been so badly treated. I think it's under, under, underestimated until you meet a parent just how devastating it is to have your child effectively put against you. In, in the most vicious and, and, and distressing way. And we've released lots of guidance, as you'll see them outside. We've got a great website, stat, stat, well, we've got lots of great websites, but Stats for Gender is a particular jewel in the crown where you can get lots of stats, lots of kind of easy to read, accessible, especially for the journalists around here, uh, <laughs> where it kind of leans on a very high quality uh, um, research. And also we have, uh, you know, some webinars. We did the first ever webinar on RGD and a lovely website on, uh, the gens on the parents' voices. You can just listen to parents' voices. And we do do, we, then we kind of, as soon as we started as a voice for parents, we realized quite quickly it wasn't enough, that the parents needed a voice, but actually uh, the, whole, the whole thing needed to be addressed. There was an awful lot of detransitioners coming to us and they needed help. We ran D-Trans Awareness Day, so the following kind of March 22, and then we ended up, as a result of the money we made out of D-Trans Awareness Day, it was just a webinar platforming detransitioners, just giving them the mic, and it went on for hours, just like this today. <laughs> and uh, just loads and loads of detransitioners joined in and just said their story, or some of them gave a presentation. I particularly liked Michelle's, I remember on the day. She gave a very, very kind of concise analysis of what was missed and how she came to transition and then detransition. And so then we found it, a year later, we found it Beyond Trans, which is a, a, a kind of sister organization of Genspect, and we fund therapy for, for anybody who's been harmed by medical transition. And that's been a really interesting kind of 
run of events because we realised how much hostility, and it's very justifiable and it's very understandable, how much hostility there is for therapists among detransitioners. They don't want to go to, to therapists a lot of the time. They, they frankly see the therapist as where, where it all went wrong. And they're right. You know, and you couldn't work in this field as a therapist and not think, we have lost our way as an industry. There is something really rotten in the core of therapy. And the detransitioners have an antipathy towards it. It kind of feels like going, it feels like going back to the, the scene of the crime. And even if you're going to a new therapist who says all the nice words, how can you trust that therapist? So we've kind of realized as time has gone on with Beyond Trans that there's more needed. And we you kind of realize this kind of little kind of slide says it all. There's hopes and expectations just like there was before trans. And then there's disappointment just like there was before trans. And then there's a recalibration. So at the beginning, the person might have felt unhappy. And then they had this hope and expectation that transition was going to revolutionize their life, transform them. And then they're disappointed by what happens. They're disappointed with the results. And they recalibrate, and some of them come to the decision to detrans. It can start all over again. It can start all over again. So there's hopes and expectations that they're going to detransition, and that will be the answer. And then there's a disappointment in the detransition experience, of course, because it's harrowing. You know, there's a, a liberation when you say you're going to detransition. And then there's a kind of the same old, same old, life is still difficult. And then there has to be a recalibration. You know, as I always talk about Samuel Beckett saying, there's no cure for life. You know, we're stuck with it. This is what we've got. There, there, there isn't any other option. And there's a lot of difficulty. A little survey we did on the beyond transitioners. These are the people who use our service. It's interesting. The age range was between 21 and 48. But the most common age was between 26 and 29. And that makes sense. You know, that makes sense for who would be detransitioning. Sex ratio, you can see, mostly female. But surprising number of males, really, 38.5% males using the detransition, you know, using the therapy service. And um, if you look at the, this kind of slide there, you can see 50, over 50% are using the individualized therapy, but some of them go to the therapist facilitated group sessions. Some of them go to bridging the gap where we talk about career provision and things like that, helping them out. Our emphasis more and more is less about therapy and more about what else can we do to kind of, in a way there has to become a very frightening time in anybody's life, especially somebody who has been deeply distressed where they kind of go, oh my God, it's completely up to me. There, there is nobody else here who's going to help me. It's, it's frighteningly up to me. And yet, there's an empowerment in that terrible moment where you realize it's totally up to me. This is really, really scary. And actually, it's quite liberating and frightening. And so we're kind of, we're, we're thinking all the time about how we can help. This is a little bit of the Beyond Trans feedback. You know, Jay gives a lovely comment. I honest, honestly don't think I can find... So we asked them, what is your response about it? I honestly don't think I can find words to describe the impact on my life. Your support has given me the tools to regain control of my life, understand the complex web that led me down this path, process the grief and find myself again. I'm forever grateful. Now, that is just one person's. One person finds therapy at the right time and it all comes together and for the rest of their life they say therapy is amazing. You'll have a lot of other people say, no, rotten, hated it, didn't like them. <laughs> Do you know what I mean? So just because we're, you're picking out the ones that are good, it was interesting one at the bottom corner there, I don't regret transition because there's no point. You know, it's a good point, really, you know. So um, one person said there, the second to the left there, it allowed me to talk about my regret without feeling like it wasn't allowed. It also helped me realize my situation isn't nearly as dire as it seemed. It gave me hope. So I'm not going to kind of go on and on and do self-praise the whole time. If it's right, it's very right, and it can be transformative. If it isn't, the person has to move on. You know, you can fall in love and your life can change. You can meet a great friend and your life can change. You can move, you can get to nature, you can read poetry. There's lots of ways to feel better. And the arc of detransition is very like the arc of transition. We have all this on our website, but it's about the hopes and expectations that there's a solution and then the recalibration when you realize it was a false solution. And it's actually same old difficult life that we, we're, we're continuously grappling with. Every one of us today, we go, well, especially if you're like me, hopes and then, you know, 
high highs and low lows. I, Alastair did this lovely, uh, it's, it's on the Gems Tobacco website. It's an image of Detransition Island. It's, uh, you know, it's, it's, it's beautiful, but it's also sad. There's so much in it, and you, you'll find it. So yeah, we've kind of moved on now and we're providing training, Genspect in the larger sense, providing training, very much focusing on where can we provide training in schools or clinics or corporate organizations. Where, where can we get our word out the fastest? Where do we, because there's so much work to do. And so we came up with the Killarney Group, very much as a think tank. If you're interested in being involved, please email us. We want thinkers who are looking for solutions. Like I said earlier, we've, we've plenty of criticism. We're brilliant at it. As a movement, we're excellent. Now we're looking for solutions and resolutions, and that's tricky. Trying to figure out how to handle the child who has puberty blockers and they're in the school, and where do they go for you know, sports and you know, changing rooms and all that sort of stuff. There, we have some really tricky, tricky um, problems ahead. And so, uh, obviously, our big solution of the day is the gender framework, which is sold out. <laughs> and uh, you, can, you can get it, obviously, you can get it freely available online on the Genspec website. So we're going to move on now, and we're, you will be very pleased to hear we're going to go and have the panel discussion. So get your questions ready, have your hands up, and make sure you uh, pick our brains. Thank you very much.